Because adversity is often the breeding ground for development. Dive into neurointerventional stories, the uncensored interviews. Our guests, all leaders in the field of neurointervention, share the difficulties they face, the complications they have had to manage, and speak without filters on little discussed, sometimes controversial, or simply taboo subjects. Hello, my name is Nantia Sujijantararat, and today I have the pleasure to welcome Dr. Rautio. Dr. Rautio, welcome. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here and very pleased for the opportunity for this. Dr. Rautio, can you briefly introduce yourself in a few words and potentially touch on your training and the path to get here? Well, my background is a radiologist, and then I went to interventional radiology first. I'm from Finland. I work in Turku University Hospital, and Finland is quite a small country, so very fast I then changed to the neurointerventions. So that's what I have been practicing, I think, last 20 years, mostly. So we start the same for everybody. So I'm going to start with the, the toughest question first, which is that um, what would you say are the biggest professional difficulties that you've had to face during your career? Well, this is a good question. Uh, I work in a very, well, not well, quite small unit, and we are not too many there. And since I have worked at the same place, and I had a boss who was quite strong and very good to do make the decisions and then I worked with him for several years and he taught me into the field of neurointerventions and then at some day I realized that he actually is going to retire and I need to take his shoes and I was very scared for that at first I really didn't like the idea but nowadays I'm just like enjoying that mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> So you, you you just came in and be a leader. That's uh, that's the Indeed. hard. Indeed, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a bad difficulty to start with. <laughs> and j just uh, maybe pardon my ignorance, but Finland has one of the best registry in neurovascular. Is that right? <laughs> I think so because Finland is quite a small country, and like I think everything is sort of like well organized, and everything is like sort of in 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 boxes it's everything is like taken care of yeah. So yes yeah 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 awesome have you had to overcome personal difficulties um in the pursuit of your profession and can you elaborate on that a little bit uh in finland and in scandinavia altogether so the gender does not make a very big difference mm -hmm. actually so i have felt myself comfortable when building my career Although there are not too many female neurointerventionalists in Finland, I think we are three at the moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. so and we have a long maternity leave, and that makes family life much mm -hmm. much easier. I have four children myself, and I have managed that pretty well. And mm -hmm. I think it's like in my country, it's your own decision how you handle your working life and mm -hmm. family life, mm -hmm. and everybody is supporting that. The medical education itself does not cost much university education normally either doesn't cost too much mm. and the hospital covers up to certain limits or your congresses or whatever education you need mm. so every wow. everybody has the same opportunities mm. so we'll talk about the most difficult case that you've had to treat in recent months do you have anything in mind yes i do have one it was not long ago we had a newborn child with a posterior circulation fistula and mm. we don't treat that much like newborn children mm. and I didn't feel very comfortable and not very confident with the treatment decision like including the timing of the treatment and luckily I have a very nice network of colleagues I think around the world mm. and now and then I consult my colleagues in Finland or approach and at the end so we got a proctor to help with the case and first we decided to wait a few months to let the child grow first and then good planning so we succeeded to do the treatment in one session it was quite tough because the child was just like a few months and mm -hmm. we needed to count the amount of contrast and mm -hmm. find suitable devices for the very small baby as well as like to count the radiation dose for mm -hmm. the child mm -hmm. And indeed, we even got like technical support from the Siemens to limit radiation because we had the new machine. So I think everybody was very supportive. And I think mm -hmm. this is like the, the environment where you need colleagues and 
help from other people and you need to dare to ask for that. Right, right. What did you end up doing, by the way, just out of curiosity to treat? Uh, we did onyx embolization with, with like, for, I think we had three different lines, so it was quite a long procedure. Yeah, <laughs> I bet, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so do you ever refuse an intervention? Yes, I do. I, I think I have reached the age <laughs> when I can say no. <laughs> and sometimes I think that the clinicians are too optimistic, like when there's a patient with SAH and then you they ask you to do the endovascular procedure also, although you think that maybe the patient is a little bit old and they are not clinically too well, those are the situations when I nowadays I dare to say no, although I think the age is not a limit as itself mm-hmm. now, but the clinical condition makes a difference. Yeah. Right. Yeah, those are always um, mm-hmm. tough, tough, tough to tough. say no to the high grade because every once in a while they bounce back. And then mm-hmm. I think as a young mm-hmm. practitioner, sometimes it's even kind of yeah. harder to make that decision. Yeah. But like you said, experience is, is what mm-hmm. makes you comfortable, mm-hmm. right? So we sometimes have cases that appear to be simple but turn out to be much more complicated. Do you have any example of those cases in mind that happened to you recently? Yes, yes. I think we always have the mm-hmm. like the tough cases you have in your mind. You forget the good cases mostly. <laughs> At least I think so. But we had like an acute SAH patient, and he was clinically quite. He was fine, mm-hmm. in good clinical condition. And I thought we would just do the simple coiling and then just leave home. But then after we placed the first coil, so there was there was the hemorrhage visible, and then in most of these situations you can just calm down and the bleeding stops quite fast when you place the second coin like, like that. But this time it didn't do that and the situation was very bad at the end and well, it looked so bad so that I called the daughter and like hearing her voice when she realized what was going on and me telling her that probably the father will not cover from this. Mm-hmm. So those are the situations where you really don't want to find yourself, especially when you first think it's going to be just an easy procedure. Yeah. So, And it's something that you need to go then through with your whole team mm-hmm. afterwards as well so that everybody needs to feel not comfortable but sort mm-hmm. of like find the right way to get out of that. How do you manage you know, the pressure, the external pressure of getting excellent results with the complicated uh, nature of some of these cases. Mm-hmm. I think this comes as well with the age, so that when you have done enough procedures and you really know that like the good results may be better than the excellent results, so that everything is anyway for the patient's best, and we do not want to harm, especially the elected patients. Mm-hmm. So it's not easy, but you learn it with your... Yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you manage compassion fatigue? Which is a real problem in our, our field. I think it's a problem, yeah. yeah. Because it's it, it, it comes to all of us. Like when I first came out from the medical school and I didn't know what to do, so I went to the oncology mm-hmm. and I was there on the ward for a few months and I still remember when I, I was like into the patient's lives and I was crying there with relatives and with the neighbors, with the patients. And I was so happy when I came out from there (laughs) and went to radiology. (laughs) And I I was like just interpreting the images and that was easy. But then when I went to the interventional neuroradiology, I was sort of again in the same situation. But now I'm more into the treatment decisions as itself so there's so much like good and bad things. So at the end, I think I have found my balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, let's now focus on patient care in your country. Obviously, there's a, a variety of the way each country works and in the, the framework of reimbursement, which sometimes frame the way practice is formed. Okay. In your opinion, in what areas should your country focus the resources on? Can you describe sort of the, the current health policy and regulations on your practice? This, I think I don't have very strong opinions about these because the 
public health care as itself is one of the best things in Finland, yeah. as it is in Scandinavia, I think, all, all over. Mm-hmm. So it's like myself, I don't have any extra health insurance. Mm-hmm. I have four children, but I know that if I or my family, some of my family members need treatment or something, so we get it at the public site. Mm-hmm. So, of course, you might have some cues and like that, but everybody is taken care of and everybody is getting the equal treatment regardless of the age or social status. So, not much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's probably not not a good question mm-hmm. for someone from yeah. Finland. Which yeah, is yes, very yeah. Well Finland known has for. been uh, like <laughs> chosen for the happiest country in the world. Like for I don't know reason. how many times. <laughs> <laughs> how do you judge the current landscape of research in your country currently? Do you feel that it's it's adequate, or um, what would you change about it? This is something that could be better. Finland has a population of 5.5 million people and that's not a lot. Mm -hmm. We have five university hospitals altogether and as I said so we are around 15 INRs working together so (coughs) I don't know anybody of my colleagues who have done like a long research project so that they could do it like only research so that's something we should do more Mm -hmm. and should concentrate in more. You're you're saying because there's so much demand on the clinical side, mm-hmm. it's hard to exactly. set aside yes. the time yeah. to do research. Yeah. I got you. Okay. So then maybe we'll talk a little bit about the, the data and the evolution of, of the discipline. How do you deal with the situations where at times you have to deviate outside of the guidelines that are already available? And how do you manage personal risk in these cases? That's a good question. I do remember when we started the thrombectomies, like long ago Mm -hmm. and there was no current guidelines at the moment Mm -hmm. and most of the neurologists were against that but despite of that Mm -hmm. some of them really understood Mm -hmm. how we should do and then when the first positive endovascular publications came out so it really changed also our everyday lives Mm -hmm. and I think that we should have the chance to choose treatment outside of official guidelines but it's very hard to decide who is to make the final decision and at least it should not be the patient or relatives yeah. who make the decisions because because I think that all of us can make the good marketing talks mm-hmm. so that I can tell how or why this should be treated because mm-hmm. it's like if uh, I can't be very objective, mm-hmm. I think, when telling pa- patients. So it's 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 a hard mm-hmm. hard question. Yeah. yeah. And now with the new devices that are continuing to come out, how do you balance the potential benefits of new treatments, because there are a ton, with the associated you know, risk on your practice and uncertainties on the outcome? You need to know the old treatment methods as well. You really need to know and know the, the scientific data that's written on those, because everything is based on those and when you think about aneurysm treatment, so <coughs> as was seen today, so we do less and less simple coiling nowadays. Mm-hmm. And it might be that it's not very sexy. It's like it's much more fun to show in social media, like your nice images when you have done some web or artist or contrary cases. Everybody is following those. Mm-hmm you are like more popular. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we need to focus on the benefit for the patients. Mm-hmm. As soon as there's new devices on the market, so they should be proven and tested if they are better than the old devices. But when who is to test them and who is going to be the test patient? That's mm-hmm. the next question. I would never would like to be the test patient That's myself. Yeah. Yeah. Although I know that the devices have been tested somewhere else. But who is to tell to the patient that you are the first one yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be tested with this new device? Yeah. We don't need we don't know all the risks anyway when yeah, you have the new right. device. Yeah. Would you classify yourself as um an early adopter, kind of mid adopter or late adopter? Actually I'm the early adopter. <laughs> <laughs> That's the opposite of what you said. I am, but it's sort of <laughs> I'm a very early. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard in our fields because yeah. I mean these are these are so attractive. <laughs> these technologies. Yes, indeed, yeah. they are so attractive. But there's yeah. something yeah. else every time I come to these these meetings. Um, all right. So to go off of that about the collaboration with industry, 
How do you see this fitting into our field and how do you integrate it into your practice? I think we really need it and we need to use it, the collaboration, like intervention on neuroradiology is itself, it's a very small area as itself. So when any of us comes with an idea how to improve the technology, so I think we should forward it to the industry and most of us have collaboration at some level with the industry. So it's it's like our own duty to say what we need for mm -hmm. the future and for the treatment to make it yeah. easier. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting that you say it in that way. I think you're the first one that phrased it in a way that it is our duty mm -hmm. to guide, yeah. to guide yeah. this. Mm -hmm. which because I you know the best, agree. like your needs. Yeah. 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 So we're going to end with the four questions that we ask everybody. The first question is that if you can go back 10 to 15 years, I'm going to put a little spin on this. What would you do differently? What do you think our field should have done differently? I would like to learn more from my collaboration colleagues, like neurologists and neurosurgeons, and so that what they do, So because I think that it would help me to understand better what they need and what they do. And if I had an opportunity, I would spend a few months in the clinic just seeing what mm -hmm. they do. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Very fair. And if we fast forward 15 to 20 years, how do you imagine the field will be at that time? It will evolve uh, with the help of the artificial intelligence. So there will be hopefully more custom-made devices, mm -hmm. more accurate treatment for like certain patients. And we will replace more and more of the conventional methods and new treatment methods like subdural hematoma embolization and IIH standing will come so there will be like more and more neurointerventionalists hopefully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if we now turn our attention into the training of the interventionalists coming out today what do you think we're not doing enough for them? I think it's the same as I said already before so that you need to know what the others do the other specialties so that you understand their needs and the indications for treatment so that you can find out your own way to treat and the new methods as well. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to end on a more positive note by asking if you have to pick something in the past months or years that have come out, what initiative, person or technological advancement would you say would be the highlight of our field? I'm happy with my working environment. I'm really enjoying, although I have been working there like for the last 20 years, because we share everything. Nobody is left alone. We discuss all the cases together. Nobody is to come afterwards to you and say that you did something wrong. You mm -hmm. need to say that during the procedure and say that you should do this and this rather than do that. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I think we are a very good, good team. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You have a, like a supportive mm -hmm. um, partner. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's very good. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Altio, for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>